Hi, good evening and welcome everyone. My name is Becky. I'm the Programming and Collection Development Librarian at Storrs Library. Um, I wanna thank the Longmeadow Historical Society uh, for co-sponsoring this program and also to Glen Meadow for their donation to the Historical Society for which they requested specifically to help underwrite this program. So thank you to the, the Longmeadow Historical, Historical Society and to Glen Meadow. Tonight we have the history of radio. Uh, um, it um, is based on the Connecticut Radio Museum. It's an organization born out of a private collection that I was working to preserve and share the history of communications. Um, it's a small building, it's open to the public um, and it, its collection has grown uh, tremendously over the years. Um, it's based a lot on a lot of volunteer work um, without federal or private funding. Um, so we invite you to uh, learn the history of early radio uh, through the museum's lens. Um, and this presentation today is by John Ellsworth uh, from the museum. So John, thank you very much for donating, uh, for contributing your time um, and for presenting with us tonight. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, this is a, is an adventure. It's a, uh, it's a story, I, I, one person dubbed this as the museum that wouldn't quit. Um, but the, uh, the, the museum represents a, a very wide range of, his, of uh, communications history, but it started out as a radio museum. And I'm gonna give you a little background as to how this all happened. And it's quite a story, quite a trip uh, through the past 30 years that the museum has been in operation. Um, I was a public school teacher at Southern Penn High School for 30 years, and I taught technology education. And um, I never imagined that I would be an electronics teacher, but about uh, three or so years into my career, uh, the school is having a hard time finding a good electronics teacher, and they asked me to teach it. I had taken one course in college that I didn't understand anything about, um, and that was about the, the extent of my knowledge at that point. So um, I started to learn and stay ahead of the kids. And uh, after doing this for a year or two, I started to enjoy it and really got into the, the electronics end of it. And at the same time, my wife and I at the time were uh, an avid tag sailors and antiquers and we go around antiquing and tag sailing. And one day I came to a tag sale and there was this little vacuum tube radio sitting there for sale for about five bucks. And, I said to my wife and said, gee, I wonder if with my newfound knowledge, I'd be able to fix that. So I bought it and took it home and fixed it. And the next thing I knew, I had about 200 of them around the house and I was an avid collector. <clears throat> so <clears throat> whenever we had people over at the house, we had a big Victorian house in New Britain at the time and they fit in beautifully in the, in the architecture. People would just be amazed at the radios and wanted to know all about them. And so we realized there was an interest there. And um, um, I began putting on displays at libraries um, and, and different places that had uh, display areas. And um, they all were accepted with rave reviews. And so I said, wow, this is, this is interesting. People are, are interested in this. And I didn't think, I, I thought I was the only one that was interested in the history. So we were living in New Britain at the time and we found a little kind of hole in the wall rent. It was a, a, a former corner store in a uh, three family house down on the corner of Wallace and Arch Street in New Britain, which was not a good location, but it was cheap. And uh, so we rented it and we set up what we called five decades of radios in about 500 square feet of space, probably not much bigger than your, your living room. And, um, we advertised everywhere we could freely and uh, people came. Uh, I was amazed. And um, so, <clears throat> let's see if I can get things to advance here. Uh-oh. Can everybody see the please stand by? Can you give me a wave or a nod? Yes, okay. Yes. All right now, oh, here it is. There we go. And there's the little place I had described. It was a, a cute little place. And, um, uh, but it was only about 500 square feet of space and very, very compact. But uh, we put advertising out in every free way that we could, free listings and weekend sections and so forth. And people came. Um, 
we were amazed. Um, we had people from starting to come from all over the country, not only from the state, which was also amazing to me. But one of the things that happens when you open a museum like this, which I never suspected and never realized was that people were gonna donate, not necessarily money, but stuff. Uh, this gave them their opportunity to clean out grandma's attic and get rid of some of that old radio stuff that was up in the attic. And so there were days I would come to this facility where you see the guys standing there right now. I couldn't get in the door. Um, I had to dig my way into the museum um, because there was so much stuff piled up in front of it. Um, so it was, it was an interesting experience to start off with. Um, I don't know who that young guy is, but... Um, I guess he was the original curator of the museum uh, about 30 years ago. That was me. <laughs> but this is some of the inside of that first, uh, first museum. Uh, one of the things we started way back in 1990 was swap meets. Uh, they, I found out through doing this that there were a lot of people around the area that collected old radios and liked to sell, swap, and trade them. So we would schedule days usually on a Saturday and all these guys would come in from all over the place and set up tables and put up all their radios and they'd sell them or swap them or trade them and have a lot of, a lot of fun. It was a great social activity. And um, that began to help support the museum. As I said, the, the donations came in like crazy and uh, we were in a very small space. There was a good sized basement in this building, which we were not renting, but I had to put the stuff somewhere. I couldn't leave it on the curb. So I put it in the basement. Uh, which didn't make the landlord very excited. Um, and uh, so a year and a half later, uh, they kind of kindly asked us, could you find another place? Um, and we moved on. Um, actually, there was quite a period of time between there and this facility that you see on the screen now. Um, at the same time this was happening, I ended up taking over the department chairmanship for my, my school department. And I did not have the degree for it. So I had to go back and take some grad courses. And um, the same time we closed the first facility in New Britain, uh, we moved to Avon and I had a big barn in the backyard. So the whole museum was moved into the barn and there it sat for a couple of years while I did grad work. Um, but in that first year and a half in New Britain, a number of guys stepped forward and we got this little team of volunteers that liked to come down and help out at the museum. And so when I finished my grad work, I approached all those guys and said, guys, you want to see if we can find a new place for the museum? And they all, all said, sure. So we, every, every other Friday, we'd gather around my kitchen table, have coffee and donuts, and we'd talk about buildings that we saw during the past couple of weeks and if they might be a prospective location for the museum. And we would go around and talk to the people that owned them, or many times we talked to the town managers of the town that the buildings were in. And uh, most people didn't have a lot of vision. Um, <laughs> we would go in and talk to a town manager with a beautiful proposal. And as we walked out, we could hear the proposal hitting the round file on the floor. And uh, no one was really interested until uh, we had a, a volunteer with us by the name of Russ Baldwin, who was from East Hartford. And he said, East Hartford is really trying to pick things up over there. They had a first town downtown program going. And they said they're going to have a big kickoff and um, that we should go. And so we went and the mayor at the time was Bob DiCrincenzo. And we kind of buttoned hold him at the whole gala and told him what we had. And he said, you call my secretary first thing Monday morning. I want to have an appointment. And so we met with Bob and they had the Comstock building um, on Main Street in East Hartford. This is um, uh, right at the end of Burnside Avenue where Burnside and, and Main Street come together. Um, the town had taken the building for back taxes, put a brand new facade on it, but was looking for, you know, a, a new buyer and also people to occupy it. And they had 1600 square feet of space in the front of it. And um, so we worked out a deal and this became the new home of the Vintage Radio and Communications Museum. Beautiful location right on Main Street, easy walk-in access. Um, and growing space, which is what we needed. We went from 500 to 1,600 square feet of space. Uh, there's the ribbon cutting with Mayor DiCrincenzo and a number of the volunteers of the museum are there. Um, it, was, it was a good spot for us. And uh, the doors opened up right onto Main Street and you could walk right in and, and see the, uh, the displays. 
some of the early uh, radio equipment that was there. These are 1920s uh, early AC and early battery sets with the headphones and the separate speakers on the top that we had on display there. We had a big supporter at that time, and this was probably late 90s at this point. That fellow sitting at the desk, if you can't see on your uh, computer screen, is Bob Steele. And he got wind of what we were doing and thought it was awesome. And he called me up one day, he said, Johnny, you want me to come over and do a talk? I said, sure. <laughs> and um, so we set up the little table there and a the little display. And he was supposed to come over and do 45 minutes. We had about 60 people in the museum. And he sat down there and just started talking. And about two and a half hours later, they were trying to get him the heck out of there. Uh, he was having a ball telling all the old stories of broadcast and so forth. But sadly, a few years later, he passed away and we lost him. Uh-oh. <laughs> things, things are moving again. Uh, that old nasty year and a half, we were a year and a half into Britain and then closed out. And then we got into the Comstock building and a year and a half later, the town sold the building to a dentist who wanted the space that we were in. So guess what, we were out. Um, so we went back to the town of East Hart Hartford and said, uh, do you have any other buildings around? And just up the street from that on Main Street was an old IHOP building. Uh, you may be familiar with the old A-frame building and um, it had been sitting there vacant the whole time we were in the Comstock building. And so we kind of kept our eye on it and we asked and got connected up with the owner and. He didn't have any immediate plans for it. He did have it for sale. It was on the market. And so we worked out a deal and moved from 1,600 square feet to 2,200 square feet of space. And the way we did it, we put the notice out that the museum had to move. And about 60 volunteers descended on the museum, all coming with their little dollies and wagons. And the whole collection rolled up the street. Uh, you can't see it in that picture, but it was in a light snowstorm. And we moved into the 2,200 square feet of space of, of the uh, IHOP building. There it is. It was rather shabby when we moved in. So, you know, we can't have a museum in a shabby building. So we went to work and cleaned it up. We painted the exterior. That roof was all metal and that was looking terrible. So we actually climbed up there and we painted the whole roof. And um, this is another one of our swap meets going on in the parking lot. Uh, it, it was right adjacent to the AAA diner, if you're familiar with that, in East Hartford. And um, we're doing great. It was a really nice facility. Um, there's some of our telephone and transistor radio collection. And uh, if you recognize the old IHOP ha houses when you went to get your pancakes, there's the windows that the bench would be in front of for you to have a, uh, a breakfast at. As you can see, we've got more than radios. What happened as we began this process, other people stepped forward and said, wow, you got radios, but what about TVs? In fact, the TVs came from a former student of mine. He was still a student in college, in high school, I mean, and um, saw the value of collecting old TV sets before they got totally thrown out and gone. And so many of those TV sets came from him. He's still occasionally involved with the museum today. Um, we have telephones now. Russ Baldwin, I mentioned before, was a projectionist and he started bringing in movie equipment, movie projection equipment. So the collection just grew, um, not only within the radio area, but also throughout communications. And that's why we lengthened the name and made it the Vintage Radio and Communications Museum. During the time we were there, uh, we were looking for all kinds of ways to advertise ourselves and the Big E was going on up in Springfield. And um, we called the Connecticut tourism people and said, you know, what's the story up there? And at the time they had no space in the Connecticut museum for, uh, in the Connecticut building for museums. And we thought that was rather strange since there were many very, very nice museums in Connecticut that should be spotlighted. And so we found out that as the three weeks or so of the Big E goes on, displays move in and out of the building. And there may be a lapse of two or three days in the display space where there's nothing there. And so we talked to the administration and said, how about we take the space that's vacant while another 
And that's exactly what we did. And we kept hopping our displays around the Connecticut building. Um, and it worked very, very nicely. We got a huge spike in people coming to the museum and knowing about the museum, but that is our museum on display in the Connecticut building. There again, the same thing. You may recognize it if you've been up there, but we took any spot they gave us. And uh, of course, now if you go to the beginning and go to the Connecticut building, 95% of it is museums. So we kind of started that whole trend towards displaying museums up there. Oh, oh boy. Well, a year and a half went by at the old IHOP building. And guess what? We fixed it up really well. And the guy's for sale sign worked and he sold the building. So we were out again. And um, so we went back down to the administration of the town hall and said, we just got booted out of our uh, second place in East Hartford. Do you have any more places for us? And <clears throat> this building you see here was the old town hall hardware. If you're familiar with the East Hartford area, you probably know that building. Um, it was set way back from Main Street. And what they did is they built a strip mall in front of it. So it kind of became an albatross in the back parking lot. Um, but we didn't care when there was a sign out front, we could put our sign out there and people would find us. So this was 5,000 square feet of space, beautiful building, all flat, uh, no handicap access issues. And it was right next to ID4. Um, some of you may know coming from uh, the east into Hartford, you may remember this building because when it was a hardware store, uh, the roof was right at the same level as the, as the high, highway coming back from the east. And in the summertime, they'd put a mannequin on the roof with a bathing suit on, pushing a lawnmower to advertise that they were a hardware store. And in the wintertime, they put a park on him, give him a snowblower, and he'd be up there on the roof blowing snow. Um, but it was, a, it was a great spot. A lot of people could see it and um, we thought it was wonderful. So this was our grand opening. We had a little band there to perform. And another swap meet, we're still doing the swap meets. Uh, if you notice on the front of the building, we have our name across there, the Vintage Radio and Communications Museum of Connecticut. That sign is about 50 feet long. The original hardware store had a neon sign up there. And when we, got the building and plugged it in, we found it still worked. So we put milk glass, uh, plexiglass in front of it so we could light it up at night. And uh, that was blazoned out so you would see it coming from the Boston area on in. This is the inside and we got uh, dividers uh, from the new departure building up in Bristol. They were uh, revamping that building, it was no longer new departure. They were turning into multiple use. and. Uh, the manager up there was one of our supporters and he got all these Hauserman panels for us to create these spaces for displays. <clears throat> I mentioned, uh, you know, the orphans, don't forget those are still coming in. Uh, our, our front porch is constantly filled up with this stuff. This is not a display area, obviously, this is storage. Uh, this is a small piece of the storage at this point. Um, the, the actual display is actually the tip of the iceberg of the collection, even still today in the present building that we're in. Um, it's a massive undertaking. We have in front, there's instrumentation. Uh, you see cathedral radios in the background, um, but um, again, more variety of communications equipment started coming in and our, the, the width of what the museum covered just kept getting broader and broader. One of the cool things that we had while we were there was Powell Crosley was the founder of Crosley Radio and began his career as an electrical engineer making radios. Um, he was a very successful businessman and moved on to making kitchen appliances, uh, stoves and refrigerators. As a matter of fact, we have a refrigerator in the museum that is a Crosley with a radio built into it from 1941. And he continued to expand his horizons and he actually built cars. And this is a Crosley car. It's probably about as big as you're riding lawnmower at home. It's a very, very small car and they're very cute. But uh, we knew of a group that collected them in, in Connecticut. We thought, what a great thing. We could feature all the Crosley radios in the museum and have Crosley cars outside. And so this was at one of the meets. Uh, one of the other things I want you to notice in this picture is that big retaining wall. The retaining wall behind is what holds up I-84 and it's within about 20 feet of the museum building. Keep that in mind. <laughs> more, more Crosley cars. 
and they made them in every shape and color and kind that you could find station wagons, sedans, pickup trucks, and they're all the cutest little cars you ever saw. <clears throat> There's a bunch more of them, some of the people out talking, you can see the highway behind. Well, I keep mentioning the highway because uh, about a year and a half, there it is again, that wonderful number of a year and a half went by and we were sitting there one day and this big drilling rig comes into our parking lot, begins drilling holes in the, dry, in the parking lot right along where these cars are sitting. We said, hmm, that doesn't look good. And um, shortly thereafter, I got a call from the state and they said, um, we have a project in mind and we are going to widen the highway and the building you're in is going to have to go. And I said, oh, okay. We weren't really surprised because we would sit there on Saturdays and the trucks would come up over the rise from the East Hartford side and the, and the, and the um, traffic would be all backed up and you'd hear them slamming on their brakes and smell the hot rubber and the whole bit. So we figured they were gonna do something. And um, so we said, oh boy, here we go. This is what four times we've moved. Uh, we're getting a little tired. We were about ready to pack it in at this point. And um, the state called me back again and said, um, listen, you're, you run the museum, right? I said, yes, I do. And he said, you guys are an up and going entity. The state has got to take care of you. I said, oh, really? <laughs> this sounds good. Talk to me. And so the guy said that I think they ended up, we were only renting the building. So I think they took the building by eminent domain because I don't think they could come with an uh, agreement with the owner. But um, for us, they said, inventory your whole collection and we need to get an estimate as to how much it will cost to move your collection. I said, oh boy. So we went to work, it took us about a month and a half, all hands on deck. We had to weigh and measure everything that we had and get a full inventory. We sent it out to five major moving companies um, in the area and the cheapest quote came back at $32,000. Uh, that's how big the collection had grown uh, with all those orphans coming in off the front step. Um, so I called the state person back and I had one more question for him. I said, listen, we've moved four times. We moved ourselves every time. If we move ourselves, do we still get the $32,000? He said, oh yeah, definitely. He said, you will. And he said, we're going to give you another 10,000 because you got to change all your advertising and all your letterheads and everything. I didn't tell them we didn't have any advertising or letterheads, but um, we said, that's fine. So they gave us about $42,000 to get out of the way of this project. Now to you and me, that sounds like a lot of money to them. It's like pocket change. They're throwing coins in the ground to get us out of the way of their big project. And that was it. So um, we move on again. We let it be known throughout the greater Hartford area that we are now looking for a location and Windsor piped up and Windsor had what they call the Rappaport building. It is this huge industrial building right along the railroad tracks in the center of town. If you're not familiar with Windsor, uh, this building, you, it's very hard to get it all in one picture because it's 86,000 square feet of space. It's huge. And an older gentleman by the name of John Moynihan owned the building, had owned the building for ages and he had a young developer working to develop the building. It was a wonderful historic building. Um, it was built in, in three different decades in two different centuries, because there's three sections to it, A, B, and C. Um, and it had Rebington Firearm had been in that building. Eddie Electric had been in that building. Um, there were many, many, the tobacco industry had used that building. Uh, so it was a wonderful historic building. And um, so they were looking for an attraction and we were an attraction. So we talked to the developer and the developer said, yeah, this would be good. And they invited us in and put us in this front part of the building you see here. You might recognize the sign up there. We took it off the old building since you're gonna tear it down and put it on this building, same sign. <laughs> but uh, this is our display inside, but this building was not handicapped accessible. A lot of work had to be done to it. The town was wonderful in letting us go ahead and operate anyways um, until things developed further. But what happened, the developer couldn't put any, any 
anything else in a package together to develop the building. And he had a drop dead date with Mr. Moynihan and that date came and went, Mr. Moynihan threw him out. So now we're in this big empty building uh, with no developer and um, the collection is now expanding. People heard how big a building we were in and they continue to bring stuff. We had straight rig box trucks back up and dropping things off saying, oh, my uncle passed away and he used to run a radio store. And <laughs> it, was, it was overwhelming to a degree. Excuse me. But we continued to operate. This building was so big that we would actually use bicycles to get from one end to the other. Uh, no exaggeration. It was very long. It was a dog leg building and it was just a huge facility. <clears throat> and so we're kind of doing our own thing there and um, doing pretty well. Um, would have been nice to have been in a, uh, in a finished handicapped accessible facility. This is all ham equipment you see here, a, a bigger and bigger uh, interest in amateur radio grew within the museum. And now we actually have a club and a whole um, amateur radio station at the museum at the present facility. Um, but anyways, one night I was sitting up and uh, about 1030, I get a phone call from Miami, Florida. And it turns out to be John Moynihan, the owner of the building who I'd never spoken to and never seen. And he said, I hear you've got a museum up there in my building. I said, yeah. So we start chatting about it. He wanted to know about it. And we really didn't chat about anything serious. I found out he served in the Pacific during World War II and so did my father. So we went down that lane and talked about history and, and had a very pleasant talk for about a half an hour and then hung up and I thought nothing more of it. That was it. A couple of nights later, John Moynihan called me back and he said, John, why don't you buy the building? I said, I'll think about it <laughs> with our, excuse me, our, sorry, our measly little $42,000 I don't think is going to buy an 86,000 square foot industrial complex. But I went to the town and talked to the, the economic, economic development people in Windsor. And they said, listen, John Moynihan has owned that building forever. He's made millions off of it. Um, and he's old, retired. He's not even in the area he wants out from underneath it. They said, offer him 100000 for the building. I said, you're insane. They said, no, go ahead and do it. I said, okay. So that night I went home and I called Mr. Moynihan and said, how would you, what would you think about taking 100000 for the building? Without hesitation, he said, you bet, and I'll take the mortgage back. So we went from being tenants in this humongous building to owning the building. Um, we took a $70,000 mortgage out from him and used the state money to buy the rest. And we now own this humongous facility. We immediately started to work with the town uh, economic development people to see if we could get a developer to come in and purchase three quarters of the building, leave us free and clear with one quarter or one third of the building and they could develop it into whatever they wanted multi-use or or condos or whatever we spent five years courting every major uh developer from new jersey to boston they would all come in and do their drawings and their beautiful uh colored uh, panoramas of the building and they all said well listen we will buy the building back from you and rent it back to you and we said no i don't think so we've been a tenant and we've been through four different facilities and uh, we don't wanna do that anymore. There was also a, another group similar to us on the West Coast called the Parham Foundation. They were in the greater um, San Francisco area and they had been through a similar situation. They had a what they called a 99 year lease at a state college campus in California. And they had some of the earliest communications equipment from the West Coast out there on display. Well. At that time, the enrollment in uh, college for California went up drastically and they needed more space. So their 99 year lease evaporated and they threw them out. Um, the Parham Foundation sued the state and about 14 or 15 years later, quote, won their case and were awarded $240,000 which sounds like a lot, but you're not gonna build a new museum for $240,000. So this was all going on at the exact same time and I knew it and it was kind of 
interesting. I, I'm a firm believer that things happen for a reason. And that was happening for us. And so I refused every, every uh, developer that wanted to rent part of it back to us. I said, no, this went on for about five years and none of them would condo with us. In other words, share ownership. And so we went back to the town. We were actually blocking their last uh, redevelopment of downtown Windsor at this point because they wanted to get this building up and on its feet. And so um, we finally went back to the town and said, listen, this is not working. We're blocking your development. Do you have another building for us? We don't want to move again. If you have lost count, there's five buildings we've been through so far with a very growing collection. So, um, oh, this is, this is the parking lot right outside that building. That's the uh, Windsor uh, train station right across the track and we have another swap meet going on. So anyways, the town had this building. This is 115 Pearson Lane and um, a couple of fellows had taken it and rehabbed it. It was a light industrial facility. They had done some environmental cleanup, put a new roof on it, but basically the building was a shell. There was nothing on the inside. Um, and so we basically negotiated, we actually ended up owning both buildings for a year because the old building, there were hangups in terms of selling it to a developer. Um, but so that dragged on for over a year and it really zapped our funds at that point. But we ended up buying this building for $600,000, um, carried a $400,000 mortgage on it and took 200,000 from the other building and put it towards this one. And believe it or not, this is where we still are today. About 13, 14 years now. So I think we finally put down roots and we've gotten away from the year and a half sequence that we've been doing all the way along. I don't think I mentioned in the beginning, but the museum is all self-funded. Uh, there's no federal funding for this museum. We've always done it on our own and there's no employees, including me, we're all volunteer. Um, and the museum has been, its 30th anniversary was this past September uh, that we've been doing this for 30 years. Uh, we've entertained people from every continent in the world, except for Antarctica. We haven't got those scientists come up and see us yet. Uh, but um, a lot of people aren't aware of how big an attraction we are in terms of global um, people traveling through, see the signs of the they uh, get wind of us through the internet and, and come and it's amazing. But this is right in our front lobby, this picture you see here, the walls, the floor, everything was done by volunteers. There was nothing in there before. Um, still in the front lobby, we have an old refrigerator in there that we sell our sodas out of and it does work. Um, kind of a neat setup. One of the things we have is a warehouse full of vacuum tubes that we estimate to be over 100,000 vacuum tubes. Um, people are constantly trying to restore old radios and they need the tubes. And so we sell them. This is one of our um, revenue streams, but many of the tubes are dead. They no longer work. So what do you do with tubes that don't work anymore? You turn them into chess sets. And this is one of our high end items that we have in our gift shop is handmade one of a kind chess sets made out of vacuum tubes. Um, European sets. These are all European sets. Uh, we started to collect a number of those. They're very interesting because the design concept in Europe was totally different than the design concept in the United States. TVs. Um, recently, we've got a couple of volunteers that are working with us that have the skills to repair the TVs. And we have a number of these 1940s uh, TVs up and running. We have our own transmitting station. We transmit our own TV signal. We transmit our own FM signal and our own AM signal to the radio so we can control our programming and put old programming out onto the, the uh, sets that are out on the floor. This is again, ham. And as I said, ham is amateur radio. Um, one of our uh, late volunteers uh, established the ham station, W1VCM. We have a licensed ham station that can talk to people throughout the world. And there is a ham club that is developed around it. And they do field days and everything at the museum, all kinds of activities. So uh, part of it. Jukeboxes. Um, we have a collection of jukeboxes showing jukeboxes from the early days all the way up through to uh, computerized. We've had some people debate us as to whether these should actually be in a communications museum or not, but I have a, a cute little story I can tell you. The uh, um, 
about four or five years ago, we had a young couple come to the museum to tour it. And apparently it was their first date. And I think they met online. They were techno geeks. They're self-admitted techno geeks and love technology. And they spent hours in our museum and having a great time, but they migrated to this jukebox. And on there, we had Elvis's Love Me Tender. This is a 1960s jukebox. So we have period appropriate music on there. And they played it and had a lot of fun and uh, finally left. And we thought nothing more of it. About two and a half years later, I got a phone call from a gentleman and he said he was the guy in that couple of girl and guy that, that came through the museum. And uh, he asked me very sheepishly if he could propose to his future wife in our museum. And we said, sure. And so he set it up for one Saturday, Saturday afternoon late. And he came in with a photographer and he had a row of votive candles going out away from this jukebox. And he had her come about a half an hour later and she came, walked in and he dropped to his knee, played Love Me Tender and proposed to her. And she said, yes. So I think there's a lot of communication going on around that jukebox, don't you? <laughs> the golden age of radio was in the late 30s, early 40s, um, and it was just uh, beautiful furniture. They had perfected the electronics to a point where it was a very, very acceptable sound that came out of these radios. But the people that bought them were putting out big bucks to buy them, and they did not want uh, just a flimsy little box to sit in the corner. They wanted something very spectacular they could put in a very prominent place in their living room and show off to all their friends and neighbors that they got a newfangled radio. Um, and that's what drove the beautiful cabinetry of the radio. Oh, I didn't get back there. Sorry, I went backwards. There's the Crosley refrigerator radio. Um, that is actually a very rare piece. We only know of three of them in, in existence in the world. Uh, the Crosby Museum in California has one. and We saw one go for sale on eBay for about $4,000 recently. Those are the only, and the one we have are the only ones that we know of that exist. We don't know how many um, Crosley made with the radio in it. That was an option. Um, that top panel can be unbolted, taken off and a plain panel put up there and no radio. Um, but there are, there's no numbers that we know of, no statistics or, or recording of how many of these uh, refrigerators were sold with the radio in it. This is our radio wall. It's a very popular wall for photographers because it's got a whole variety of tabletop sets in it. Um, and, and this is kind of an interesting story too, because this is right after going through all those big consoles. When radio first come out, came out, they were all big consoles destined only for the living room because it was the status symbol to have a radio. Well, the manufacturers were selling radios like crazy and um, they're, they're, the, the selling charge was a radio for every home. The, the sellers would just pump their fist in the air and go radio for every home. And um, what they didn't realize was how successful they were gonna be. And in a matter of just a handful of years, they had saturated the market and every living room in, in the United States had a radio in it uh, and sales began dipping. And so they got to their next convention and they're brainstorming, trying to figure out what the heck to do. And one smart Alec comes up with the idea, well, we got a radio in every home, but we don't have a radio in every room. And so they all get excited again and they all pump their fists in the air and go, yay, radio for every room and out they go. Well, the manufacturing end of that whole thing had to change everything and start getting away from the big consoles into the small tabletop sets. And they would actually design sets for specific rooms like bedrooms, kitchens, and, um, and mantle tops. And it's that design that the cabinet design that drove the sale of radios. And that's what makes them so interesting is there just infinitely many different designs out there. Um, with all my volunteers, we probably have well over 500 years of collecting experience all together. And one of the things that makes it fun for them to keep coming back and helping out, as we say, every day at the museum is like Christmas because those orphans are still being dropped off at the door and we constantly see something that none of us has ever seen before. It's just, it's amazing how endless the different designs of communications equipment is.
we have in the background motion picture equipment. <clears throat> that was from Russ Baldwin, who I mentioned before. Um, when they were tearing down all the wonderful gilded theaters of, of Connecticut around the, the state, he had the foresight to go in there, said sometimes when the wrecking ball was hitting the wall and dragging the equipment out. And we are the benefactors of that. Sadly, Russ passed away back in 05, but he left us all of his equipment. So we have the very earliest uh, hand crank projectors all the way in up through. In the foreground, you see a Victrola. That's actually a Connecticut product. And, and off to the right is our Connecticut display. We have a ton of Connecticut equipment that was made and designed right here in Connecticut. But we do have a complete uh, display of Victrolas. I think I have a picture for you coming up here. <clears throat> 1940s, uh, 1940s radios. They start to get a little boxier and um, square, but um, we're past the, the golden age of, of radio at that point. Tesla coils. Um, this is a long story. You're gonna have to come to the museum to hear it, but he was a fellow that came and worked with Thomas Edison in um, power generation. And he is basically the father of our alternating current system that we have today. But he had a dream of having a wireless system based on the idea of radio being transmitted through the air. He said, why can't we send power through the air? And he began to build, building these devices that generate a large spark. Um, both of them work and we demonstrate. We turn the lights off and put on a, a really good show with the uh, Tesla coils. <clears throat> Here's some of the Connecticut equipment now. We have tons more than what... It, is in this picture. This picture is a, a few years old, but um, the radio on the left on the top is a um, CD Tusca. Tusca made radios right in downtown Hartford. The piece in the middle is a um, Bristol Super C speaker. Bristol was in Waterbury uh, manufacturing radios. And the far one is a temple, which is uh, down in New Haven area. Vacuum tubes make all this happen, both in telephone and in radio and in television in the early days. So this is our display of vacuum tubes. Um, they are a work of art, in my, in my opinion. It's, it's amazing to see how beautiful they are. And we put them up on display. <clears throat> uh, beginnings of recorded sound. The person that uh, invented recorded sound was Thomas Edison. And he figured out how he could get a needle to scratch a groove into a wax cylinder to record sound. And that was the beginnings of everything that we do today. And this is one of his early home um, uh, record players or cylinder players. It works. We demonstrate that and a number of other Victrolas that we have there. Much of what we have on the floor works and, and we give personal tours to people that come through. Uh, many people come and think they're going to spend 20 minutes and get bored and four hours later they're still going strong at the museum um, because we have wonderful docents that can tell the whole history and background and it makes it very very interesting for our guests more of the vacuum tubes a little close up <clears throat> even the artwork on the boxes is amazing to look at um, from some of the early vacuum tubes especially you can see right in the middle, there's a Venus, uh, but just really, really cool artwork, Songbird. This is one of those things that came in a year and a half, two years ago that nobody had ever seen or heard of, of all of my volunteers who are avid collectors. Uh, this is a Colin B. Kennedy. Now, Colin B. Kennedy was a company off of the West Coast, and um, apparently they made a short run of, um, grandfather clocks. <clears throat> and uh, this was in the era of a cathedral radio. And if you look at the center section of that piece and imagine a rounded top right above the, uh, the speaker, you've got a cathedral radio. That was their Model 50. Well, this piece that you're looking at here was their Model 50A. And uh, it was a variation of their cathedral radio that is a grandfather clock. Um, a couple from Farmington own, owned it and came to one of our functions and showed us pictures and said, would you like it? We said, sure. We have about three or four different grandfather clocks on display at the museum. Mysteries at the museum. The reason why we have this is parts of Hollywood, I guess you could call it, have discovered us. Um, Mysteries at the museum have done two pieces at our museum. The first one they did, um, 
they were trying to debunk the idea of a red phone on the president's desk to Moscow. Um, everybody thinks, oh, he had this hot phone on the desk and he could pick it up and he could talk to the Kremlin. Uh, no, it was a teletype system. They, they had a, a, an open line there just for that reason, but it was not a telephone. And that's what the mysteries of the museum were trying to debunk. And we, they searched all over the place, couldn't find anybody that had a working teletype. Well, guess what? We did. <laughs> so uh, they came and uh, spent a good part of a day filming and photographing and the whole bit. And we were a part of that, that display. Um, they also did a piece on Orson Welles' War of the Worlds. And we had the microphone model that Orson used. And so they came and did a whole piece on that. Um, and that was amazing. They came early in the morning, they rented the museum for a whole day and they left at 10 after six in the evening to film a microphone. Of course, they filmed the museum too. If you're familiar with the, with the, the show, they profiled the museum, which is great coverage for us. But um, it was amazing to see all the setups they, they did around that microphone to, uh, to uh, show it in the show. This is a um, display that we hope to have open maybe by this fall. We're starting to really get time to work on it. But one of the other things that's happened is um, transmitting units have been migrating to us, <laughs> commercial ones. The first one we got was the old Gates transmitter off of Avon Mountain from WTIC. We knew some of the engineers up there and they pulled some strings and they were gonna retire this 1957 Gates transmitter and um, channeled it to us. And that's what began the, the flow. This Collins that you're looking at here was the first FM transmitter for WRCH. Uh, these are huge boxes that stand about six, seven feet tall, about three or four feet wide and probably nine, 10 feet long. Um, and they are the commercial transmitters at the TV station, uh, the radio stations and TV stations um, that put the signal out to your radio at home. Um, so we are going to open up what's called Transmitter Alley, and you're going to be able to walk through a history of commercial transmitters, transistor, uh, transmitters, starting with WPOP's transmitter from Newington uh, from about 1936, which is very early. The very first commercial radio station went on the air in 1920. That was KDKA down in Pittsburgh. So the, the first transmitter we have was within about 15 years of the origins of commercial radio. Um, and for many years, they, the engineers cobbled their transmitters together. They were not commercially made. So that's a very, very early piece. We hope to have that display open by, by the fall. <clears throat> Excuse me. We do quite a bit of educational stuff aside from our displays and our tours, which are very educational. Uh, we run a class called the Crystal Radio Building class. The simplest and first receiver there ever was, was a crystal set. And most people don't understand, it's very, very easy to pull the radio waves out of the air. You need a coil like you see in the picture there, a diode, uh, an earphone, antenna, and a ground, and basically you can pull radio stations out of the air. And uh, so we have done classes, many, many, many classes for kids from seven to 97 um, and they all love it. And you can see the look on his face. It, I, I call that the Eureka moment. Uh, they, they spend an hour and a half or so building this thing and they get kind of frustrated. And then finally we get it done and we go into the studio and listen. And as soon as they hear that first noise come through their little radio, it just blows them away. They just get so excited. <clears throat> the Eureka moment. This is a radio repair class. Um, a number of our guys are very skilled in radio repair. A number of people out there are trying to restore old radios. So we open the front of the museum up for them and um, they bring in their pet projects and um, a couple of our guys help them out and learn how to fix it. And they're quite happy when they go home with a working antique radio. Um, so it's a lot of fun. It's another educational piece that we do through the museum. <clears throat> oh, end of show. That's the end. Um, I encourage you, I know with COVID going on, it is crazy. We have been open. I don't know how much longer we're going to be able to be open with things going the way they are.
but we've had all the proper PPE in place and um, our, our attendance is down, way down. Uh, we're struggling a little bit financially that way, but um, uh, people are still coming through and having a lot of fun. Um, we don't have huge packed days. Generally, we may have three, four, five people in the museum at any one time. So it's not where you're gonna be at a mob scene. And uh, we all take a lot of care to make sure everything is, is um, healthy. Um, but hopefully this COVID thing will be over and you can all come and visit the museum. Uh, we have 4,000 square feet of display space. That's where all those pictures were coming from primarily. Behind that, um, we have another seven to 8,000 square feet of storage up to here. Um, the, the display area is basically the tip of the iceberg of our collection. Um, and if people are really interested and want to spend time, we'll take them in back and show them the whole thing. <laughs> but um, the way we maintain the museum is a lot of different things, but with all these orphans coming in, we can't keep them all. So we sell many of them that are not important historically. And we run an eBay business every single week. There's items up from us on eBay. Uh, the swap meets that you saw, we also put uh, surplus stock out during the swap meets and uh, we just cannot handle it all. We, we thought at one point we could hold on to everybody's treasures, but um, it's impossible for us to do it. But that is one of our big uh, revenue streams also. Uh, and that's down a little bit at this point too because of COVID. So, all right, I'll stop. If there's questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Thank you, John. I'm going to um, change the settings so that people are able to unmute themselves. Um, so I just turn that on. If anybody has any questions, um, you're welcome uh, to ask. You can also put them um, in the chat box. Um, before we start questions, I do want to let you know I am putting, sorry, um, the website for the museum in the chat box right now. It's the Vintage Radio and Communications Museum of Connecticut. So that link is now in the chat box. Um, go ahead and click that if you want to open it up um, and you can save it for later. You could bookmark it. Um, so we have um, a couple of questions. Um, any early radio connection uh, to the Springfield area? Uh, yes, there is a lot. Um, American Bosch was one of the biggest companies that made radios up in the Springfield area. Um, and we have a number of American Bosch on display, um, but there was quite a bit of technology going on up there. Yes. Um, do you have a link to your eBay store? Um, I think we do on our website. Yes. Okay. Um, I believe we put it on our website. It is our initials. We use our initials for a lot of things because the name is so darn long. Uh, so we shorten everything. Our, webs, our, our website is VRCMCT, which is Vintage Radio and Communication Museum of Connecticut. Um, it's the same on, on eBay, I do believe. It's just the VRCMCT. Okay. I don't have any other questions in the chat box right now. Um, does anybody uh, want to turn on their microphone to ask a question? We'll definitely give it a moment for anybody who's entering, might be typing anything in. Wait for that to come through on the chat box. Usually when I talk in person, I ask how many people have been there, but it doesn't work this way because I can't even see hands. So <laughs> hopefully some of you have been there. Oldest radio on display. Um, that's hard to determine because in the early days, all right, let me go back. Um, the way the technology developed, it started with uh, telegraphy, telegraph, which was hardwired point A to point B. And that was always a problem. The wires were always a problem, the whole bit. So that drove them towards going to wireless telegraphy. And at that point, what they were doing, they were using a spark. And whenever you make a spark, it puts out radio waves, which are very unruly. They go everywhere, basically. Mm -hmm at every frequency, but that was wireless telegraphy. They would use a key in Morse code and basically create a, zzz, 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 a, a buzzing sound. And um, the spark that resort, uh, resulted from that would transmit a signal out through an antenna. Um, the receivers for those were basically the crystal sets that I mentioned before. And then um, 
Reginald Fessenden in 1906 um, developed modulated signal, which meant that he could carry his voice or music over the air. It was really kind of interesting the way he did it. He was working up in the Marblehead Mass area, not that far from here. And he developed this idea. And it was towards the end of 1906, probably about this time of the year in 1906. And um, so he started to send out Morse code. And keep in mind that these guys had their earphones on, uh, the only way you could listen. And all they'd ever heard coming through the earphones was zzz, 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 buzzing. And so he would send out a Morse code, listen to your receivers, Christmas Eve, 9 p.m. That's all he would tell him. He had a curiosity factor going. So he kept repeatedly putting this message out. And finally, 9 p.m. Christmas Eve comes along. Of course, everybody is tuned in. They got their headphones on. They got their clipboards ready to copy because they would have to write out what the, uh, uh, what the Morse code was. And he starts playing strains of Silent Night on his violin. Think about that. Having never heard music transmitted through the air, that was the first time and, and people just didn't expect it. And we think that is probably the very first radio broadcast. We consider radio modulated sound where unmodulated sound was wireless telegraphy. But the receivers okay. in this time were all crystal sets and most of them were made by hand. Um, there were no manufacturers at this point. There was no RCA, there was no, uh, you know, Sylvania, nothing. And so these were all handmade receivers and we have a number of those in the museum, but because they're handmade, if the person who made it didn't date it on the inside, which they never did, we have no idea how old they are, but they could go back as far as uh, 1906 and before it could be turn of the century, some of them. Wish I could give you a better answer. <laughs> we'll just have to go to the museum to find out. Yep. Hey, thank you. Can I throw a question out real quick? Yeah. Sure. Oh, great. Hey, hey, John, I'm really, this has been fascinating. Thank you so much. Lots of good information. Um, thank you. I'm kind of personally just interested also in the sort of the broadcasting end of radio. <clears throat> I, to this day, I enjoy radio more than I do TV. Yeah. And I, I grew up and we had the, lived around here and we had WBZA <clears throat> broadcasting from around here. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but. Uh, yeah, in Springfield. That's, yeah, that's what I listened to. Well, and. Uh, for many, many, many years, and uh, uh, it was really exciting. I think there's been some very early broadcasting that went on as well in the Springfield area. Yes. That might be an interesting addition to your museum at some point. Well, uh, uh, yeah, I'll tell you a story. We, we were approached because that building, the original, uh, it was Westinghouse building that was up there, had the original radio towers on it up until a few years ago. And we were approached a few years back because they were going to raise the building. And they said, would you like the towers? Wow. <laughs> we had no way of getting them. Really? I mean, they were huge. But it was a very historical thing. And we would love to have had one of the WBZA towers yep. in our yard. But we yep. could not figure out a way to get it there. And so sadly, they tore the building down and they're, they're gone. But yes, you're right. There's a lot of history there. Thank yep. You. We have a lot of people saying thank you and what a fascinating and wonderful presentation this was. Uh, so I just want to echo that and share that with everyone. And we do have some more questions in the chat box. Uh, the first one, do you have any equipment from the 1960s and 70s? Yes, we do. The, the timeline goes well up. Um, see, this is the thing with the technology museum. It, it was kind of funny when I first started it years ago, I had some, and they called themselves real museum people came into my museum. They were art people. And they looked around and they said, I don't see anything more than a hundred years old. This can't be a museum. I said, well, <laughs> this technology doesn't go back that far. In fact, I had in the early nineties, I sat down with a gentleman who was in his nineties and he was one of the pioneers of radio. And we sat in his living room in West Hartford and we interviewed him. And one of the things I asked him I said, when you're, it, it, he, he was an expert. He was an antenna tuning expert now and, and very highly regarded. And I said, when you're a kid, you must have been doing all kinds of stuff with the radio and making crystal sets and the whole bit. He said, nope. I said, why not? He said, it hadn't been invented yet. That was, that blew me away that I was sitting in the room with a gentleman who was around before radio ever happened. And so these people don't understand that the timeline for a technology museum is totally different. 
than the timeline for an art museum. And I mean, the timeline for us, if it's 10 years old, it's antique. Um, and so that's a problem we have. We now have personal computers in our museum. Uh, I'd say five to 10 years ago, we were arguing whether we should or not, whether they were too new. Now we have a wonder, wonderful display. We have a, a, a new volunteer who's taken it on and is doing a wonderful job with that display. And um, we have to keep moving forward. We have a Palm Pilot on display. Um, and, and as time goes on, we will continue to move the front edge forward. I don't know where we're gonna find the space to put it, but um, the, tech, the technology moves so fast. And because it's technology, the technology industry really has no interest in its history. And so they're really no help. A lot of people said, and maybe this is gonna answer another question is, you know, do you get support from, you know, all the big companies? No. Um, none of them are at, all, are at all interested in history because they're so involved with moving the front edge of the technology forward. Um, and many of the companies that we re represent, Zenith, Philco, RCA, they're all gone. Um, so you can't look to them to get support. Um, so we are very independent and, and purely supported by ourselves. Okay, um, another question. Anything with the Coast Watchers during the Second World War? Um, yeah. again, some of these projects were just too darn big, but there, we got an offer out of Canada of a transmitter that was a part of that network. Um, and it was a beautiful art deco cabinet. Um, but we just couldn't work out the logistics to get it down here. Um, but yeah, that, that's a, a wonderful history. There are so many different pieces of this in there. Uh, the early warning systems and the civil defense systems, um, yeah, there's many, many aspects to it. And uh, the last question I have in the chat box at the moment is, do any items connect, do you have any items connected to local political figures? Uh, someone works at the Coolidge Museum in Northampton um, and he was the radio president with the first inauguration on the radio. <laughs> you guys are asking great, great questions. Um, and, and, I, and I almost hate to answer this question, but um, we have, early pictures of Coolidge with his early radio. It was a battery set. It was a three black front with three knobs across the front. And we believe we have the exact same model in the, in the museum. So we went to the Coolidge Museum in Northampton. I'm very familiar with, have a place up in Western Mass. We go through Northampton all the time and stopped in and um, they weren't interested. <laughs> uh, if you've been there, they have a room it's a fairly good sized room and they have a number of displays around and they have some pictures of that technology. They show him in front of a microphone. I said, we can put that actual microphone here. We had the same model of it. No, they weren't interested. So it, it was very disappointing because we really wanted to have a remote display you know, for self gratification. We'd have our name on the display, Vintage Radio Communications Museum a little bit. They were not interested. That that museum, I don't think, has changed in decades. Um, the Coolidge Museum. It's just it's there and it's taking up space. Sad to say, you you have to. Really oh. <laughs> oh so son. that's I'm the one who works there. I've been there since 2004. Uh oh. <laughs> and so, um, that was definitely before my time. If you were okay. there my time so well, i'm glad i said something because i'd like to work with you and see if we can do that because we still have that radio and yeah we actually used to have the rate his actual father's radio that his right. father heard the inauguration on yeah. it was something that was on a long-term loan and yeah. when the person who had owned it um died and we tried to buy it from the estate the son took it back and sold it at auction uh, um, and so we actually don't have the radio, the actual original radio is in private hands. Okay. Um, but we have been wanting a similar radio for years to buy, <laughs> to put on display something that looks like it. So um, yeah, definitely uh, get in touch with me because if you were there, it was before my time. Excellent, okay, <laughs> good. I'm glad I opened my big mouth. <laughs> Yeah, um, we're not open right now, but. Um, well, you went through that whole time, the reconstruction of the, you know, and it was closed for a number of years there. Um, but yeah. 
That would be yeah, awesome. The, it was renovated um, 2001, the second floor of the library. So, okay. and I came in 2004. Yeah, so it would have been just before you were there probably because, yeah, I think we stopped up right after the renovation. So, yeah, good. Um, I'm trying to think, how, how can we connect? Um, I think my, my uh, email is on the website or, or just message us through the, uh, the website because we have a Squarespace uh, message system and I'll see it, it'll come to me. Okay. Um, that would be great. I'd love to work with you. Perfect. Thank you. I just put the contact us link um, in the chat box. Um, yeah. So that's, it's a form to fill out. Um, yep. So I'm guessing that's what's, what will go to you. And it comes to my email. So yes, Julie, okay. do send that, yes. Great. Um, if there are no other final comments or questions, I think that's a great note to end on. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you again, John, for sharing the history of the museum and some of the history of communications with us. Um, we've got some applause emojis. Um, you were a great, great presenter. Um, this was a lot of fun and I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to present with us. I enjoyed it too. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Some more applause on cameras. Thank you again. And I hope everyone has a good night. Thank you. You too. Take, Take care. care.